Hello everyone, this is Siege and Ovo 992 and today we're back for the brand new video and you know I find myself in this weird situation that I've not found myself in too many times over the years to be starting a game reaction the exact same way as I did before because if you think of it, our last game I started off by just saying that was such a relief and felt like a weight off the shoulders, well it was the exact same coming in this game because as the whistle, the final whistle echoed through the stadium you could hear mutterings of groans and moans and frustration from the Hearts fans knowing that they could have grabbed something for that game. That was just music to my ears as I just sat back, rolled the head, unclenched the cheeks, people, and said, you know what? That there is the true definition of three points and up. Dun. Sideways? Whatever. The roads. Honestly, the squeaky chair of destiny people was like this Rangers attack. It's so out of the place and it's straight up annoying me because I'll be honest, what we went through in this game of football is the complete opposite of what we should have went through because we never made enough chances to win this game 1-1, which we did. Three points up the road, delighted with that. We didn't make enough chances to win it 2-0. We never made enough clear-cut chances to win it 3. That scoreline in that game could and really should have been 4, 5 or 6 and honestly I don't think you can really argue with that now. You could maybe argue that if Butlin is not the greatest thing since sliced bread that Hearts would have had a couple goals in their team but if you just look at pure and obvious and easy chances in a game of football, this Rangers attack is simply in fury and I might have said this before but if Tupac was shot by the Rangers attack that man would be turning 53 the day and not only is that painfully true but I've been doing that joke this long and I've had to experience and we've had to experience misfire and Rangers attacks that long that I used to do that joke when he was turning 50, knew the guy would be 53. <laughs> what seconds me troops is for once the dog had came, you know what I mean, the clouds had parted, the sun had rose and his name was Cholak, somebody that could sniff out a goal and put him in the back of the net, but we shoved him out the door and it wasn't just that, we spent 13 times, 13 times as much to replace the lad there and all three players combined have they even came close to replicating the goals output that Cholak did by this point last season. Do you see what I'm talking about in terms of madness and insanity with this football club? I really appreciate everyone sticking with me and I know you've gone through the exact same. This team is maddening because how on earth did we not win that 4-5? Six nothing. But I guess I've seen us play a hell of a lot better and lose games and drop points so I can be happy with all three points and trust me I'm but as always we like to talk about everything in the game of football and I think it's fair to say between me and the that level of output from our strikers is just not sustainable going forward. That's a game you drop points in if you haven't got a goalkeeper like Jack Butlin and maybe ride the luck in terms of Tav doing a brilliant goal line clearance early in the game. We rode the luck that way but by God goodness gracious did we no do it the other way, clear cut opportunities and I really like Danilo, you can see what he offers and he's a spark and he's work rate but his finishing has simply been tragic, I was screaming at my tail like put the mask back on, honestly it was like watching Jim Carrey in 1994, but where there is obvious frustrations and ov obvious negatives there was a couple of bright sparks throughout the game of football and that's what I'm going to focus on next, the misfire and attack is a problem, I'm not going to bury my head, I'm not going to pretend it isn't there, equally I don't think <laughs> any of them is a natural goal scorer in front of goal but we've talked on that before so you know my opinion on that, but there was a couple of bright sparks and again I need to talk about about Ross McCausland and I'm probably going to say something that's going to annoy a lot of people but let me finish my sentence or two before you jump in the comments and scream at me and be offended but the long term viewers of this channel will remember a couple years ago when the likes of Glenn Middleton burst onto the scene and really started to play well, really played well in Europe, scored in Europe, assisted in Europe. He came into the scene very young, 18 years old, burst into the team and had a similar level of impact that Ross McCausland is doing right now, being flung into the deep end because the 
team around him couldn't kick during arses and it does real bring me some memories and similarities when I look at the two of them out and out wingers bringing in this day and this and I just hope that we do not fail Ross McCausland the same way we failed Glenn Middleton and ruined that boys conference when he was right up here again the team was nowhere near as good as it actually is right now believe or not I know we're frustrated at the squad but the level was outstanding but truly Ross McCausland is the first Rangers player I've seen truly burst into the team and stay in the team for the next month or two since Glenn Middleton. That's it. Alex Lowry's had good games, but then he's been gone six months. This guy's came in, he's been gone two months. I'm talking about consistent week in and week out and play well. There is some real similarities. And again, I just hope and I actually truly believe that Clement will manage Ross right and build him up right and he can be a mainstay in this Rangers team before. So I, I just wanted to mention that because the last time I seen a youngster come really in and just grab the game by the scruff and then he can inject life was the likes of Glenn Middleton. And that's what I'm seeing for Ross McCausland because going to Tyne Castle is a tough place to go. You didn't get much time on the ball. It's quite a compact place. The Fans are right there, they're right on you, hearts are always up for it. But every single time that I was getting nervous, being a Rangers fan, thinking, oh, they're going to tell me a tight... I'm still, te I'm still treating him like he's my son. You know what I mean? I'm watching him going, oh, no, that's a tight area I passed into. He might make a mistake here. But every single time he's got the confidence and belief to bring people into play, bring the ball into different areas. And I'm just standing back saying, this laddie isn't a youth player. We need to stop looking at him as a youth player anymore. This laddie right here is a true Rangers player. And that's the biggest compliment. I can give the young lad and again I hope he keeps his head down he doesn't get distracted by the noise like we've seen before stays hungry he's got the new contract now the same as Glenn Middleton did after bursting onto the scene keep this lad hungry managing and use him right and we could really have a star because for me the biggest creative spark with the likes of Seymour on the park Daniel on the park Cantwell on the park even Tom Lawrence for the short time he was on the park the biggest spark to this Rangers machine was young Ross McCausland. But I, I guess you can go and scream at me now for liking in the likes of Ross McCausland to Glenn Middleton, but I think a lot of people forget the impact that Glenn had over the first two months when he burst on the team and earned that new contract as well. But let's move away to someone else that really impressed me in this game of football, because there was a couple of names. I thought the two centre-backs deserve a special mention. We're very quick to criticise them, but I thought both Balogun and Connor Goldson, who should have had two assists, and the longer you watch today's video, you will hear that broke down. I thought they were powerful, and when you really needed the ro the, the sleeves rolled up in the last 10 minutes when balls were flying in. It's probably the first time that in a long time that I've seen not only Balogun, Balogun's always kind of been like, if I'm honest, throwing his head to everyone, but Goldson was powerful in putting his head where it hurts. That's the first time I've seen the big laddie truly take over a game in the air for a long, long time, and it's probably the two best performances of the season, and if either one of them was doing it here, we're probably conceding with the amount of crosses and free kicks and corners they had in the last 10, 15 minutes. So shout out to the two centre-backs, but the end that really impressed me is probably going to surprise some people, because I know he made one mistake in the game. People like to latch onto the one mistakes and that but when you touch the ball as much as Lunny you're going to be making the odd mistake I think the level of performance that Lundstrom does if it's anyone else if it's like Jose who we're all excited about if it was Jacko if it was anybody else if it was Lawrence we would be plodding standing up saying that there was a true midfield performance but because so many people's checked out because of Lundstrom rightly or wrongly because he's like you're doing here or there no one's talking about Lundstrom but the effort and the work rate 78 and 90 minutes, eh, 78 minutes, sorry, he's still sprinting down the wing and injecting us. I thought he was outstanding, especially after the change from Lawrence where it did tweak the midfield. For me, Lundstrom stood out almost as brightly as Ross did, as Ross has the flair going forward. But if you're asking me who was the man of the match and the main reason we got something for that game, as much as other people impressed, I think you take Lundstrom out of that, um, out of that team tonight, the entire thing falls apart. He was truly the spine of that team. So I just wanted to give Lundstrom some credit as, again, I've sat here and been critical when I feel like he deserves it. But the day, I think he deserves some praise. And I don't really know where I am right now, if I'm honest with you, but I think I've started off stating my frustrations, but delighted and ended it with a massive boost. So let's get into the game recap and speak about things a bit more naturally than shall we? Because it was always about the start with Tyne Castle, especially against Hearts. What was it going to be? I think you saw from the Hearts side, they picked an attacking side, which was the first time this season we've really seen that. And also, I thought Rangers picked a really attacking, brave side. And again, I didn't like using the word brave there because I feel like a Rangers team should be playing 
something like that, especially when you look at your resources compared to the rest of the league in that aspect. But compared to what we've seen previously with two holdings this, two holdings this, etc, etc, it was a brave attacking outlet and I thought right there's going to be some true goals in this this is the most brave team to score game I've ever ever seen I was feeling confident about my 2-1 troops and then 10 minutes into the game Lawrence drops and I'm thinking I can't get none even at Christmas. If I wasn't sad and down enough, if I didn't feel like my crown jewels were kicked hard enough watching Lawrence drop to the floor and have to walk off the park with not a thing colliding or anything like that, we then put the single worst corner I've ever seen, right? I know what you're all thinking, here goes CJ for the next four minutes, I'm going to skip because he's going to talk about corners again. But it's chronic now, right? I need to talk about the 11th minute. Go back and watch it, please. For me, just for me. We take a short corner... We pass it to Redvan, who's the last one back, for him to cut inside to try and pass it back to Tavernier, who hit the corner. We give it away. Hearts take it, and Hearts nearly score as Shanklin hits it just over the bar. If we're talking how low the bar is for corners, it's now started setting other teams up. Can we do something about it? I'll move on, troops, but unfortunately I need to move to the 24th minute of the game as the big moment for Hearts came in. It was a bit of a sweaty cutback if you play any EAFC 24, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for those who don't, they ran down the wing, they passed it in. It was far too easy and too weak for the Rangers defence in my opinion. They cut it back to Shanklin, five, six yards out. He smashes a shot, big Jack Bolton with a wonderful save, not only saving it, but pushing it out that way, but unfortunately that way, it falls right to a Hearts player who hits it on the volley, but thankfully Tavernier not only makes himself big, but keeps his arms doing trips, because if it hits the hand, that's a red card and possibly a penalty, but because he keeps his arms doing, ends up smacking him on the back, and that's a fantastic goal line block for Tavernier, that's the stuff that happens to us. Trips so to finally see it happen, sensational, and to see it happen to Tav, who people say can't defend, was tremendous storyline in itself. And it relieves this ticker right here and it relieves all of us, I believe, to see that that moment they are sparked this Rangers team actually into life. Now, why is it taking 25 minutes every game? That's a problem for the manager to look and identify what players he can trust to start games of what There's only so much he can do with the broken toys that he's got right now. But we did spark into life and it was young Ross running down the right-hand side. Brilliant with a counter-attack. Ends up cutting inside. Sensation. I'm thinking, look at the balance on the man. But to give credit where credit's due, the actual dummy fake cut inside is defended sensationally by the Hearts player Akinson, I believe. And now, brilliant bit of defending the clears away, but at least it was something and it was something and it started to build and then we have the ball into the back and it is the the ball comes whipped in beautifully by Seema Golton headers it into a dangerous area I believe and then Cantwell volleys it into the ground where Danilo flicks a wee heel at it and it ends up going into the back of net but as the replay shows troops it's a mile offside and it's quite ironic because the only time I've ever seen Danilo hit Sahan first time is when he's offside and the shot that was originally hit by Cantwell is going in is it not just painful supporting this football club? Everything else, he takes more touches than it would honestly make Glenn Kamara blush. But the one time we didn't want him to take a touch and just leave it, just nonchalantly hits it into the back of the net. So, aye, it was painful, but I guess the ghost of Sakala continues as we have yet another goal for another trip to Tynecastle that's reeled offside. So, yeah, somewhere in Saudi Arabia, Sakala, I'm sure. He's smiling. Speaking of smiling, the, the, the emotions that went through during the first and only goal in the game was crazy because we actually played it in deep. We were having a lot of long, aimless balls and that was frustrating. Again, just doesn't let us settle. It doesn't gel. Whereas I understand hearts have got space and we're not used to space so we're getting excited. Pew, 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 pew. We're like John Wayne in a Western, right? But... The one and only time really in the first half that we said, right, we're Rangers Football Club, we're actually got some guys that knows how to play football, let's play it. We get the ball down in the deck, it starts with the goalkeeper, into Golton, into Tavernier. Tavernier does so well right here, and his gallop forward, and then his pass is absolutely ridiculous, Troops. It was as ridiculous as Cantwell's ball that he played versus St Mirren that got him an assist, and this one was thankfully smashed into the back in eight by Seema. Wonderful ball in behind Seema's run, spectacular to keep on side and then the composure to finish by Xander Clark. It was a wonderfully created goal and it frustrates me when I need to watch the long ball guff football because that there is what we've got in it and 
Tav's positioning in that game, in, in that move, sorry, and not only in the game, does give me a wee bit of conversation where I want to go next. Because I don't know if you're noticing, it has drastically changed Tav's overall positioning. He's seemingly, he's still gone forward, but he's coming more inside and almost making a midfield free, where it seems to go the left-hand side with the fullback, whether it's Ridvan who started this game or Barisic. They're still bombing on as forward, but with Ross McCausland having natural whiff there, Tavnier's actually coming in to here. And I tra genuinely believe this is the start of the transition of seeing a Tavernier move in to the centre of the park because the way he's able to pull the strings is sensational and it's very reminiscent if you've watched any Liverpool games with what Liverpool does with Trent. Instead of having him bobbing forward constantly all the time, he's actually just coming in field and playing passes in the inside. And if you watch Rangers games, not only that move, but if you watch it constantly, normally when balls are getting whipped in or getting played across the box, you're expecting Ross to turn around and pass it to Tav, right? For the cross, he's not there anymore because he's inside the middle of the park a wee bit now. And that's a very interesting tweak and that's the first real change in a system and tweak in a player style that I've seen under Clement. And I like it, Trips. This goal right here is a benefactor. And I thought it's much more secure than that. And I think it's suiting Tavernier, who, again, is getting a little bit older now. And I don't think can bomb up and down, up and down all day right now. So it's a smart bit of management. And I'm very interested to see that develop. I don't know if anyone else has noticed it or if you think I'm talking crazy. But look at it now in the next Rangers game when you see it. He's no constantly at the back post. He's coming in centrally and pulling the strings that way. But to finish up on the goal, by the way, I just want to mention something very briefly that did annoy me. Seema scores a great goal away. He's looking at the away fans. He's wanting to celebrate with the away fans. But Willie Collum, who's got the biggest pick me, pick me attitude that I've ever seen. You see, when you can just tell someone's picked last in fives. And shout out to everyone who has picked a last in fives, by the way. Your, your sacrifice is definitely noted from all of us. But it's just him in it because he needs to make everything about himself because after a Rangers goal he sprints 15 20 yards to stop Seema for celebrating every slogan football's for the fans fans would be none eh, football wouldn't be none if, if, if fans fans do this I fans pay and spend an absolute fortune and shout it to everyone who follows this club everywhere we go and they want to have that moment with the player because that's what football is it's an emotional game we want to connect we love and we breathe this club but then we have to sit and watch a referee tell the player not to celebrate in front of the guys who spend on a fortune a couple weeks before Christmas to follow their football team. I'm sick to death a football getting ruined by goons. I really, really am. Everyone's videoed now. Everyone's dragged down by VAR. Nobody can celebrate goals. And nobody can even celebrate when goals are actually given anymore. I don't know what football is becoming, but that slogan they say, football is for fans, is absolute nonsense. And it's pick-me attitudes like this. Call, call them running all the way to stop Seema for celebrating. Jog on, wee man. Let the football and the fans actually connect. By the way, we then need to talk about a couple of incidences. One where Campbell's very close with a very cute little volley that just goes over the bar. But you know what we're going to talk about? We're going to have to talk about Danilo now because we are, the game started off pretty rough for us. We're Butlin and Tavernier need to make two great saves. We were new in the lead and truly dominant in the game and dictating chances and it should have been dead and buried right here as a ball drops to Danilo inside the box once again. I think this is also Goldson he done over of our mixed up the two chances. Anyway, Golton, I think he does it over to Danilo. Danilo takes a touch, sets up and just hits it straight. Is there anywhere else? It's in the book. He's no eight yards out. It's not for the penalty spot. He's within the penalty spot. It's about five. If you're lucky, six yards out for goal. And you can see him, if you go back and you watch it, he thinks he's scored. He's away running to celebrate as he hits it, but he's not hit it anywhere near clinical enough or hard enough. And it just gives Clark another wee impressive notch on his resume, especially against the old form, as he seems to make save after save. But where I give him a lot of credit, and I will give him credit later on, this one right here is absolutely bogging for Danilo. And it just makes me sick, and it makes me miss the likes of Cholak every single day just a little bit more because that's two that's wrapping it up that's game set and match but instead we need to rely on a goalkeeper coming out and collecting the ball and hanging in for dear life because of chances like this and it wasn't just this chance he had an even bigger one in the second half where the ball comes in and Xander Clark just spills it drops it Danilo just needs to hit it that way that way he just needs to kick it but he takes a touch 
and that gives the defender's chance to close in on him. Then he hits it straight at the defender, and it's just dreadful. And honestly, if it was Lammers, we'd all be going off or not. And if it was Dessers, we'd be buying him a plane ticket. So I feel like it's fair is fair. If we're critical of Lammers, which I believe we should have been, and we've been critical of Dessers, which I also believe we should have been, we also need to start turning our attention to Danilo, because that there is as blatant as it comes. That is two bona fide sitters. And where I think he's still a good player, and he's got that wee bit of natural novel in him, where he does inject Sahan into this range just team, these are the moments big man, you've got to put them into the back of the net and aye, just smash it, stop taking touches all the time because again, Glenn Kamara would blush at this laddie's amount of touches that he needs to take. But Danilo wasn't the only unit to miss a sitter, nah nah, before Redvan eventually got substituted off for the very impressive Sterling and we'll get there in a few settings. Lunny has a very good shot that was well saved by Clark but it's spilled into a dangerous area and Redvan watches it come all the way down. And then blasts it out the bar. Seema standing like, hello, can I get another goal so we can wrap up this game? But you know, Rangers Football Club, we didn't do that. In fact, the only time we do it is when they're offside. Roof, I'm looking at you. That was dreadful decision. He's played through by Connor Golton 10 minutes later. But instead of running through and scoring himself, he then passes to Seema when Seema's a mile offside. So, aye, that was frustrating as Red Van blasts it over the bar. And that was his last involvement. And, and what I thought was impressive, I thought Red Van... He actually played well, especially as he was massacred at Ibrox where Shanklin continued to attack his height and attack his height with long balls. He seemed to take himself out of, out of that position and that's what we bit of saw on the, the nerdy side of my game likes because I saw what Clement was actually doing and Lunny was bumping into Shanklin and stopping him for 1v1 and um, onto Red Van and Balligan was coming over and watching Shanklin. It was a clever tweak in management. If you look at the Ibrox game, you look at here using the exact same players, how drastically different it can actually be. But then... Sterling came on and remember how excited about how excited I was about Sterling saying I think he'll be very underrated and he could play anywhere in the back line. That man is built for this league. He's got all the physicalities and now hopefully he remains injury free because for the second he came on, it just changed everything because we had pace, we had power, and they couldn't get near the boy. Couple big defensive ones where he had to say, uh, step his foot in and win the ball bravely at the edge of the box. That was great. There was two incidences where he had to block shots with his chest. His positioning was spot on. Even going into the 82nd minute of the game where the ball's dropping, it's all over the place. They hit a volley. Who's there keeping his hands down as well, getting his big chesticle on it? It is none other than Sterling. And it wasn't just the defensive side of the game which again we spoke about heavily he bombed on that left hand side and used his physicality to run all over Hearts creating a nearly moment as well as he sprinted down the left hand side and passed it across the box where unfortunately it just never fell now we address the elephant in the room of course that is his weaker side and but I thought the cross was actually pretty good it was just deflected just unluckily to the other side and can I just say his very first touch in the game was hitting an in-swinging corner? Beautiful now! I don't think the players were expecting it because they got nowhere near it, but it's much better than the nonsense we see, Sterling. So whether you are mince or no, lad, you hit an in-swinger, you're instantly in a fan club with this guy right here. So, aye, I thought he was big, he was powerful, and now he is fit, and now he is ready to go and I thought the, the nod to give him the last 15 20 minutes where it was nippy bum time if you will in a hostile environment in a game that was swinging back and forth was a nod to the manager to say go out there and press me and grab a jersey because no one's done it for the left hand side I'd actually argue that Sterling in his 15 20 minute cameo was outstanding and the amount of blocks that he put in isn't he happening with a red fan and especially nowhere Barisic how many back, back post heaters Sterling won today he's probably one mere he does at the back post the day in 15 minutes than Barisic has done in four years so I think when you go into the next game versus the likes of Dundee where we will have a lot of the ball we will be dictating a lot of the play let's see the other side of the game for Sterling we know he can defend let's see if he can really be a player at the left so for me I think if the, jer the jersey is up for grabs the man who's grabbed it at left back for me today was Sterling. But have I talked about the two chances that Connor Golton has created? In fact, I kind of hinted on one a bit earlier. Hits a beautiful through body Roof who sprints down. He's got a defender here and a player here, but he tries to curve it to Roof, but eh, Sima, sorry, but Sima is a mile offside. And then he picks a wonderful ball down to Sima who brings it down in the chest, hits it, Clark's nowhere near it, but it rolls just wide. The big man, in fact, could have had three assists if we're looking at it that way. That's how well Connor Golton played the day, but so many people didn't like him, so the Will actually ignore it because he's done his job 
but it's the people in front of him that's actually failing him and in the last big chance or the last big moment of the game obviously went the other way it was Hearts as they pulled the ball for about just outside the box no just inside the box it's rattled but thankfully Butlin puts himself in where his Hearts were a fantastic save and what really brought me joy because I was angry 60 seconds before because as Sterling sprinted on the left and just pushed somebody out the way ran in behind and won us a free kick in the 92nd minute which should have been game over we should have passed that for whatever reason Tavernier's hit it I'm going to repeat that 92nd minute 1-0 up and a away grand with no pass that in the corner he's hit it I'll leave it at that I was absolutely fuming but what's what really put me over and made sure I'm going to be sleeping like this tonight is as Hearts got one last chance to kick the ball into the mixer it was dropping about the penalty spot it comes Butlin to catch it fall on the ground and hold it till it was game over. That there is something we've not had in so long and it just makes me so happy. But that's the story of the game. That's my thoughts on the game. That's my thoughts and the players. I thought a couple of them really stood out today. The likes of Ross, I thought Lunny was very good. Butland, Goldson, Balligan. I thought Jose wasn't it great, but it was a step in the right direction. Again, let's remember, he's just back for a serious injury as well. If it was anybody else, we'd be giving him cuddles and saying, no, he's working his way and doing this. Let's give the lad a wee bit of opportunity and a bit back in that way. But aye, that's what stood it to me. What be you? Let me know your thoughts and opinions down there in the comment section below. And the next time I see you will be the match reaction for Dundee. And until then, I've been CJ92. Thank you so much for watching. All the best and bye-bye.